telephones. They're how we stay connected. From our friends to our neighbors to our family members living miles away, these devices are how people communicate. It all started almost a century ago when Alexander Graham Bell picked up the first telephone and said, Hello? Today, the Bell System, or Ma Bell for short, serves over 8 million people around the nation, just like you and me. But have you ever thought about how Ma Bell gets from place to place, besides telephone lines? Well, the answer is all around us. Vehicles. You may have seen vans like this one driving around your city, neighborhood, or street. You may have even had a Bell System repairman stop by your home to take a look at your telephone. Whatever the case may be, there are over 135,000 Bell System utility vehicles in service every day, making sure the Bell System is working the best it can. Today, we're going to show you an example. This one is brand new from Ford. Jack, I said brand new. This is the best we could get. Why are you stopping? Keep rolling, keep rolling. No, You're losing light we, here. You, okay, cut, cut, cut. We, we can't uh, have this. Kid, I'm the director. People are actually going to know it's not 1970. Nobody's going to notice, all right? We've talked about this. Keep rolling. We don't have the budget. Okay, all right. The jig is up. It's not actually the 70s, and I don't actually work for the Bell System because there is no Bell System anymore. Ma Bell was broken up by the U.S. government in 1984 because it had a monopoly on the telecommunications industry. And the eight baby Bell companies that it broke into are now Verizon, AT&T, and... Oh wait, that's it. So much for breaking up a monopoly. Anyway, there's a whole history you can read about on your own, but today we're here to talk about this. What you're looking at is a 1974 Ford Econoline E200 display van that was originally used by Pacific Northwest Bell in Eugene, Oregon. But before I get into its story, let's give a little background about Bell System vans and why they looked the way they did. The Bell System was founded in 1877. I'll skip the early history, but it's fair to say it gained a monopoly on the telecom industry pretty quickly. The government came after it a couple times, and by 1969, things weren't looking so good. American Telephone and Telegraph, the parent company, decided to do some damage control. They called up Saul Bass, a graphic designer famous for his logos and his opening title sequences in Alfred Hitchcock films. AT&T wanted the Bell system to look good in the American public's eyes. Now, as things stood, the company's branding was all over the place. My name's Handy. There was a Bell logo of some sort, but it looked outdated, and the corporate colors looked drab. So they asked Bass to create a new corporate identity for the Bell system, including a new logo, a word mark, colors, branding guidelines, and much more. It was a huge task, and the first real undertaking of its kind, but Bass was game. In 1969, he presented this pitch film to AT&T executives, during which he presented the new logo and all of its applications. It's actually a fascinating case study on its own, so I highly recommend watching it if you have the time. After he screened the film, the doors behind the screen opened to a huge warehouse decorated with all of these items, including a van on display. Now, back to this van. You'll notice I said it was used by Pacific Northwest Bell. You might be thinking, I thought this was a Bell System van. Well, it was, and it wasn't. You see, the Bell System was actually a network comprised of a bunch of smaller operating companies that served different regions. So, as far as I know, outside of that initial pitch meeting and a few specialty vehicles, there were no actual vans that said Bell System on the side. They all said something like Southern Bell, or Pacific Telephone, or Illinois Bell, or New York Telephone, or any other number of things. Here are the only other examples I was able to find on the internet. Most of these are really old photographs, so it's fair to assume the vans haven't survived. This 74 Econoline is one of only a small handful of surviving Bell System vans that I have ever seen on the entire internet. And believe me, I have looked. It's one of only two Bell System Econolines of this generation I've ever seen, and it's the only Pacific Northwest Bell van I have ever seen today. Now remember that even though the Bell System's fleet of vehicles was almost as large as that of the U.S. armies, most of them didn't last. They were utility vehicles, they weren't well taken care of. Even after they were retired from the Bell System, they were painted over and went on to live lives of even more abuse. 
Now, you'll notice I did say painted over, so I'm not claiming that this is definitively the very last Pacific Northwest Bell van in existence. What I am saying is that it's the only one known to have been one in its former life. And on that note, if you think it looks rough now, wait till you see what it looks like on the night I bought it. You have to be a special type of crazy to buy a van like this sight unseen, pay the seller extra to tow it three hours to your friend's place in the mountains, pay someone else to come and give you a VIN verification, and then take that and the out-of-state title that's already been signed over to someone else over to the DMV so that they can tell you there are outstanding late fees you didn't know about and that you now need to tow this non-running van back into town to get it weighed so that you can give the DMV that slip of paper too. All so that when the clean California title is finally in your name, you can look at this face only a mother can love. You also have to have really good friends. Really good friends who will volunteer the garage space to you for over a year, really good friends who will then drive up and help you load it onto a trailer and then tow it across town, and really good parents who will then let it take up their driveway for several more months while being embarrassed in front of the whole neighborhood and... Uh, becoming a permanent part of history while lowering property values by becoming the face of your house on Google Street View. Sorry, Dad. Did I say crazy? Let's talk about the transformation, because yes, this is the same van, and the before and after is only a year and a half apart. I could already see the original paint and livery peeking underneath a nasty coat of cheap white spray paint, some sort of caked on adhesive, tacky aftermarket aluminum trim that had been riveted onto every line of the van, leaving tiny holes everywhere in the body, and uh, oh yeah, red shag carpet that had faded to a dusty brown on the outside of the van. Don't do drugs, kids. It only took one scrape against that loose and peeling paint to pique my interest. And so began an archeological journey to bring this old van to its former glory. Along the way, I discovered and unearthed the original Bell System logos and lettering that had been hidden for decades. Excitement can't even begin to describe that feeling. It was like uncovering hidden treasure that you were just sure was there. Through this process and my own research, I was able to confirm that this was indeed an original Bell System van. I got the Marty report, which shows it was ordered with special paint, and the color codes in it match up with the ones in the super rare Bell System vehicle graphics manual created by Saul Bass. Let's take a look. A two-tone paint scheme in Bell Gray Green and Bell White, separated by a three-inch reflective stripe in Bell Blue, a one and a half inch space, and a 2 and 7 8 inches reflective stripe in Bell Ochre. The Bell logo, this one is just a magnet I added, is 15 and a half inches, and exactly 2 and a half inches away from that is the name of the Bell operating company, in this case Pacific Northwest Bell. 5 and a quarter inches away from that is the end of the van's side panel. Now one interesting thing here is that the logos and letters on this van are all white, not Bell Blue and Black like they should be, and they're also painted on, not reflective vinyl. I can tell this van was repainted at some point in its original colors, so maybe that's why. But who knows? Still interesting. Now let's go over the flaws. Number one, there are a ton of tiny little holes in the body that will need to be filled up. Not difficult at all, but tedious work if you're going to do it yourself. Number two, it has some dents. Nothing too major, but some new sheet metal will probably be needed. Number three, the doors don't open and close like they should. The driver's door can only be opened from the inside, and two of the double doors have had their inside handles broken off, so the only way to open them is by using pliers. Number four, and whatever this is. At some point in the 80s, from my guess, someone spilled industrial glue onto the van's floor and then all this trash just stuck to it. So what you're essentially looking at is vintage garbage. And in case you were looking for a good band name, there it is, you're welcome. It should come right off with some elbow grease, but I only have two elbows. Actually, never mind. With a chisel, a hammer, and a whole lot of patience, it all came off. Also, I found this lodged behind the instrument cluster. Seriously? To whoever owned this van in the 80s, you're terrible. Also, the radio doesn't work because there isn't one, but if you listen closely, you might hear something. 
Now, to offset these faults, aside from a bit of surface rust, the van really doesn't have any actual rust through anywhere that I can see, apart from maybe the tailpipe. And when we're talking about survivors, that's one of the things that makes a Bell System van so rare today. Most, if not all the ones on the East Coast and in other harsh climates rusted away decades ago. Ones like this that are cancer-free are super rare. One more thing, the floor inside the van is completely straight. No banged up metal around here whatsoever. Okay, okay, but does it at least run? No, we tried. We got it to turn over, we even got the headlights to turn on, but then it wouldn't turn over again after that. Phone line down? Give us a call! The motor turns by hand, but there is some resistance. Now here's a fun little detail, the license plate. No, this isn't the real plate that's registered to it, or in California, but it's close. In 1973, Oregon introduced these permanent fleet license plates meant for fleet vehicles that didn't need to have the registration renewed year after year. There's no telling how many of these were issued in the first year or two, but my educated guess is in the low hundreds, but possibly as low as 40. Somewhere in some former employee's attic, I'm sure there's a slip of paper that actually has this real van's real license plate number on it, but until then, this is the best we've got. I actually had to contact a string of local Oregon license plate collectors until I found someone who actually had one as old as this. These super early ones with the sticker are incredibly rare, probably as rare as the van itself. Now realistically what this van needs is to be disassembled, stripped of all its paint, have some bodywork done, have the motor rebuilt, and then slowly be put back together from there. It's a project, but it's a pretty straightforward project if you think about it. It's a van after all, there's not that much to restore. There's not much of an interior to speak of, nothing's hard to reach. It actually shares a lot of parts in common with the original Ford Bronco and the Ford F-Series trucks of the era, so finding most parts isn't that difficult. Plus eBay and Craigslist surprisingly still have a lot of random new old stock parts available for this generation of the Econoline, so it's all there. Once you address the big ticket items, then you'll be able to get to the cool stuff like the roof rack, the light, the ladder, etc, etc, etc. With all due respect, Shervin, that's me, why the hell did you go to all this trouble if you knew the whole thing had to be repainted anyway? And why are you selling it now? Good question. You see, I've come to believe that as car enthusiasts, we're never truly car owners. We're caretakers. If I would have never touched this van, it would have sat in the same sorry state it was and probably would have been crushed. Nobody would have bought it, nobody would have seen the potential in it, and this rare piece of forgotten Americana would have vanished from the landscape forever. In a best case scenario, maybe it would have been restored and repainted some totally different color which would have erased the history for good. My own plate is too full right now with other projects and life priorities, so I've decided it's time to pass the torch on to someone else who can continue this journey. This van isn't just a van, it's a time machine, and one of the last of its kind. And hopefully you too now can see the potential it has to be restored to its original glory. From all of us here, thanks for joining us. Until next time, let's stay connected. Technology has given America the best phone system in the world. Behind that technology are people, bell people, using technology to solve all kinds of communications problems and provide a wide range of new services. New technologies, such as light wave communications, microcircuitry, teleconferencing, electronic switching systems, computerized speech, microwave communications, and improving existing technologies to serve you in new and less costly ways. Making your life easier and less complicated, bringing people closer together. Always improving. That's the Bell System for you. The Bell System. People using technology to help keep down costs and improve service. Keeping your phone system the best in the world.
If you enjoyed this film, please consider mailing a subscription to Pacific Northwest Bell, 1600 7th Avenue, Seattle, Washington, 98101. And don't forget to ring that bell on the front desk so you can be notified about upcoming pictures just like this one.